Supreme Court of Florida is now in session. The Honorable Chief Justice Charles T. Kennedy presiding. Good morning and welcome to this session of the Florida Supreme Court. The first case on our docket today is the case of People's Gas System versus Posen Construction. Counsel, you may proceed. You need to unmute. I had previously unmuted, but I think it put me back on mute. May it please the court, Jason Gonzalez with Schutz and Bowen representing the appellant PGS. I'll reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Your honors, the answer to the certified question is yes. The plain and unambiguous text of this statute, 556-106, allows PGS to recover the total sum of its losses, uh, whatever the form of those losses may be. And as long as we show that an excavator violated this statute and ruptured PGS's natural gas line, we're entitled to the total sum of those losses. The statute places no restriction on the type of loss recoverable, uh, whether the loss is in the form of property damage or lost revenue or a personal injury claim. If it's a loss, the member operator, such as my client PGS, can recover all of it from the excavator. In this case, and I'll just describe what happened here, Posen is a road contractor and they were planning to do construction in Lee County, Florida. Posen was planning to excavate in an area and the legislature has set up this statute, 556-105 has these procedures for notifying utilities when a contractor plans to do uh, excavation in an area so that the utility can be put on notice and go out and mark uh, where their underground facilities are located. So you will not have an accident such as what happened in this case. Posen failed to do that. They did not properly identify where they would be doing the excavation. Uh, their manager at, at Posen knew that the line, there were gas lines in the area that had not been marked, yet he directed uh, his employee at Posen, Mr. Santos, to go ahead and start excavating. And he did not tell Mr. Santos that he knew there were gas lines in the area that had not been marked. And tragically, but not surprisingly, Mr. Santos ruptured the gas line and he was engulfed in a fireball. It was a terrible, uh, a terrible accident uh, that occurred due to the actions and failure to, to comply with this statute by his employer, Posen. Council, now, we were, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, so you, your client was sued for your own, for your client's own negligence and settled that lawsuit. And now you're seeking recovery for that from the excavator. Uh, do you agree that that's a pretty dramatic departure from what would be permissible under just regular common law standards? Well, I disagree that we were just sued for our own negligence and we strongly disagree. That's a, I mean, in the, isn't that sort of, I mean, the complaint was suing PGS for the, the, the I mean, I know there were a lot, you, you know, the two companies sued each other, the workers sued both companies, but this particular lawsuit involves a lawsuit by Santos against PGS, alleging that PGS was negligent for not responding and remarking the way it had, it had allegedly, I know we're just working with the facts in the complaint, but isn't that what happened? Well, no, Your Honor. Uh, there was one count for negligence, so you're exactly right on that one. There was another count where Posen was going, well, where Mr. Santos uh, brought a count against my client, PGS, going through all of the things it said Posen did wrong. That was a, like a negligence per se count. So I strongly dispute the notion that we settled a claim for our negligence. We've never been adjudicated negligence, negligent. We have never admitted in any settlement that we were negligent, and we don't even agree that we were sued only for a claim of our own negligence. And we're not here in this case, in this complaint in the Middle District, at any time saying Posen is somehow responsible uh, for paying damages caused by PGS's own negligence. Not at all. Every bit of our complaint uh, goes through exactly what is in this statute, sections 2A and 2B where we are saying Posen 
violated the statute. This, and I'll go through the provisions word for word. Let me first just frame this around the certified question because it is limited. The 11th Circuit is asking whether a member operator, that's PGS, has a cause of action under Florida Statute 556-1062 to recover damages or obtain an indemnification from an excavator for payments to a third party for personal injuries related to the excavator's alleged violation of the statute. And 2A says in the statute, a person violates 556-105, if a person violates 105, subsections one or six. And those are the provisions uh, that relate to the notification that they're planning to do excavation uh, and, and giving us notice to go mark our lines. And it says if they subsequently perform the excavation, which they did, knowing that there were unmarked gas lines in the area, and that damages an underground facility of a member operator, it's rebuttably presumed that the person was negligent. negligent. And then it goes on with the sentence that the person, Posen, in this instance in 2A, if found liable, we have to prove this, all these things that I just read in the statute, we've got to go to the middle district and prove those things. And if the person, if found liable, they are liable for the total sum of the losses to all member operators involved as those costs are normally computed. The legislature wrote this and they decided to shift the burden financially for the total sum of the losses to an excavator if we demonstrate to the fact finder in the middle district that they violated the statute that was in the, the rules related to notifying us of their uh, plans to excavate in this area. And then they go out and- I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but isn't really the issue. I mean, so the district where the federal district court here characterized this as a plain language case against you. You're saying it's a plain language case for you. The 11th circuit said that it's, you know, obviously ambiguous in certain respects. I think it's fair to say this isn't, you know, the legislature's best work, this statute. But I mean, I think it seems like the question is when what you're suggesting is such a departure from the what a reasonable reader in the in the world of torts would expect when you're putting it when the two parties have this kind of a relationship, when you're putting all essentially responsibility for what PGS does on Posen, you would expect there to be a clear statement. It's sort of an elephant in a mouse hole type problem. So can you can you respond to that? Yeah, well, I don't agree that it's um, ambiguous language. Total sum of the losses is no more ambiguous than all damages in the in in the Simon's trucking case. Total sum of the losses. I do not agree, uh, and I don't think Posen has ever said in any of their briefing this is ambiguous. Um, yet there, we are saying that Posen was entirely responsible for doing this. Uh, but if they're found liable for violating the statute, if we meet the requirements of the statute, then they're on the hook for the total sum of the losses. And your yeah. argument is that your own negligence would be essentially, I mean, is your is your argument though that Posen is responsible even for thing, even for your client's negligence? I mean, I'm not understanding what you're saying on that point. Well, Posen's responsible for the total sum of the losses if they didn't comply with a statute that the legislature put in place saying, you've got to do all these things in this statute and notify the member operator. And if you go ahead and, and violate the statute and then rupture an underground facility, you pay for the total sum of the losses. So then the question so, for the so court is, is this payment a, a, a loss? And no, we were not negligent. Um, well, no. I, know, I understand that you're saying that you're not, but you were sued for negligence and, and in a normal, joint tort fees or situation, which it sounds like this is what you're describing. Each party, you know, there would be a fact finding. People would find out who did what negligent, who caused what, and everybody would be responsible for what they caused. That's the norm. You're saying that this statute departs from that. And I think the question is, why, why should we read into this statute such a dramatic departure from the norm when you compare the other statutes from that both parties have cited I think all of which are very different in terms of the clarity with which the legislature spoke. And I think the question is, why should we not expect the same kind of clarity when you have as dramatic a departure from the norm here? I think there is clarity. I think it's it says what it says. And 
And maybe they don't like that there is no statutory exception that says this type of loss is not included. Uh, but we are going to go to the uh, middle district if we get our day in court. And we're going to demonstrate through the evidence that this was something that Posen did. They, we have to show that they're liable. That's what it says in the statute. So if you think it is a dramatic departure from the norm, the legislature can do that. And they need to take it up with the legislature if they want to have an exception. They spend 20 pages of argument in their brief, and not once do they quote for you, where's the exception to total sum of our losses? Is, is all the money we paid to Mr. Santos not a loss for us by any ordinary dictionary definition? Of course it's a loss. My client didn't feel like they gained anything when they paid a bunch of money to their employee for their violations of a statute that severely injured him. Now, we would have marked the line if we if they had complied with the statute. 20 pages of argument by Posen. They need to be asked, please quote for us the exception to total sum of the losses. Instead, eight times, they're arguing to you, well, the legislature really intended something different. Well, here's three examples of legislative history that, that we think should lead this court to depart from the plain and unambiguous text of the law. We're entitled under 2A or 2B. We fit within both of these statutes, and they have not once quoted an exception to total sum of the losses. Losses means losses, just like in Simon's trucking, it's plain and ordinary, uh, plain and unambiguous text in a statute. Mr. Gonzalez, suppose PGS had not been sued. Let's um, try to work through the sort of consequences of, of, of the holding that you're advocating. Are you saying that the legislature acted to extinguish a potential cause of action against PGS for contribution after the fact? Say, say, say the, the plaintiff here had chosen only to sue Posen and then only later had come to PGS. Would, would PGS have an affirmative defense to liability uh, on the basis of this statute? Well, I, that's a good question. Uh, I do want to say, I think we're getting way beyond this question certified uh, by the 11th Circuit. Um, and, and I don't know that, well, I don't think they would bring a, a, an action for contribution given the facts of this case. Um, if they attempted to do it, I mean, they're going to have their day in court. If you answer this question in the affirmative, we're going to have our day in court and they're going to have their day in court on their defenses. They can go down to the middle district and, and try to show, oh, we didn't violate the statute. We actually did notify uh, the uh, PGS of where the gas line was. And we didn't actually direct our employee to go dig where we knew there was an unmarked gas line. They're going to have their chance to bring all that. We have to prove those things. And, with the, fa and the fact finder is going to have a question uh, that they're going to have to answer, and they're going to have to find them liable. So I think it's a good question, but I think it's beyond the scope of the certified question here. But it, it's it's kind of ameliorated by the fact that uh, they're going to have these have defenses that they can uh, raise. I, I, I don't disagree. Oh. I guess what I'm what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to understand uh, the the. I mean, if, if this is a cause of action. In, you know, and and it, you know, I agree with you that the language clearly sets it up. Then, I, then the consequence of agreeing to that is that it would preclude the, I think, the cause of action that I'm talking about. So I just want to make sure that that consequence of the rule you're advocating is one that that I understand clearly. Yes, and uh, and we invited Posen was initially sued in this uh, state court action by Mr. Santos as well, and we notified them of the mediation when they were let out of the lawsuit, presumably due to workers' comp immunity. We invited them to the mediation. We were very clear from the beginning that they ought to come participate in the mediation and step up and, and uh, take responsibility for what they did because we said all along, we have this statute and we are coming after you for every penny of what you did here if we have to pay anything by ourselves uh, to resolve the, the claim of their employee who was injured. How can I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So how does this work mechanically? Is your position because you're saying that everything comes down to the total sum of losses, could, could your client settle this case for whatever they feel like settling it for and then turn around and send a bill to Posen? Well, uh, that that's kind of a, you know, the, the question of what if we engaged in a, a, an extraordinarily high settlement? I think that would be a matter of proof in the trial court, but 
if, if you know, if Posen thinks, gosh, here's an, a, a kind of a dramatically unfair way this could be applied, if they don't like that, take it up with the legislature and limit it. Well, so they, they refuse they to come to the mediation and step up and and and, uh, and take care of their responsibility. So if yeah, there I'm was sorry, some I'm absurd, sorry to interrupt you, so. hold on. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I don't think the issue though is whether it's unfair. I think the the issue is once you start read, you know, I'm assuming you know you're you're you'd have to read some sort of limitations. You know, it'd have to be reasonable, et cetera, et cetera. You know, you're talking about inviting them to the mediation. The way indemnification normally would work is you've got to give people notice on the front end of the lawsuit. They've got to be given an opportunity to defend, et cetera, et cetera. Once you start reading limitations like that into it, then you're essentially in the world of saying that this is essentially governed by common law principles. And when you're departing from that, you would expect to see some sort of clear statement. And it's not enough to just keep repeating that it says all, you know, total sum of, of damages when that has to be read in the context against which the legislature is writing this statute. Yes, I, I would definitely read it in the context and it sets forth all the things that we have to demonstrate. It does not set forth some special additional notice provision on our part. We actually did notify them of the mediation and gave them an opportunity uh, to step in. They chose not to do that. That was their right to choose not to step up at that point. It's our right to bring this, this action. I'm not just myopically focusing just on that phrase. I'm focusing on everything this statute, the legislature said what you do when this happens and they violate Council, uh, you are now uh, about a minute into your rebuttal time. You can continue if you like, but uh, you just should be aware you're consuming rebuttal time. Thank you. I'll reserve the rest of my time for rebuttal. Very good. All right. Uh, Council, you may proceed. Uh, good morning. Hinda Klein here on behalf of uh, Posen Construction. Uh, we believe that uh, the district court got it right in this case, and there is no statutory indemnity cause of action um, brought by a member operator against an excavator like Posen. We also believe that the statute is not ambiguous insofar as it does not use the term indemnity, nor does it use any other kind of language that would imply a right to indemnity. And I think the court's interpretation uh, can very well stop there. Uh, there the um, member operator here, PGS, is implying that because the statute doesn't define the term losses, that necessarily means that they can sue us for anything and everything. And there isn't a, a case in the United States that supports that contention. All of the cases uh, that we have cited and, and that uh, PGS has cited from other jurisdictions that have addressed this issue have very specific language discussing indemnity or language that specifically says that an excavator can be liable to an owner for all damages to third parties incurred by the owner. No statute and no court has said that where the term losses or a similar term like damages is undefined, that necessarily means that there's a cause of action for statutory indemnity without regard to fault. Um, in the event that this court believes that uh, the statute is ambiguous, and I certainly agree that the language used is less than artful, um, we have but, to remember. Council, could I ask you a question? You said without regard to fault, but the argument on the other side is that th that your client could only be held liable for losses that are caused by their failure to discharge the duties imposed by the statute. And then section three makes the member operator responsible for any losses that they cause. So the, the question is as phrased is can they get a, a cost, a loss, and go into court and get reimbursed for that on the theory that it was caused by your client's failure to comply with the statute. So no. So it's default base. No, because uh, we don't believe that the term losses 
incorporates uh, indemnity damages. So regardless of their argument that they're only suing us for- oh, well, I'll ask the question that counsel on the other side asked, where is the exception for indemnity to the phrase total sum of the losses to all parties? There is no language in the statute. Okay. Uh, that and why, why isn't total sum of all losses to all parties broad enough as a plain language item to cover indemnity? That, that would be one kind of loss that a party might suffer? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons why. The first is that the common law in this state is contrary uh, to the concept of statutory indemnity. There's only one statute uh, in this state that we have found that, that specifically addresses statutory indemnity. The common law in this, uh, in this state is comparative fault. And as Justice Munoz uh, noted, their interpretation is contrary to the common law in this state. And under the Hardy County case that we have cited in our briefs, where uh, the interpretation of a statute is contrary to the common law, it must be narrowly construed. So I don't think it appropriate that opposing counsel uh, kind of shifts the burden to us to show that statutory indemnity is accepted from the statute. I think it more appropriate that we require uh, PGS to show that it is part of the statute. But and can, the statute counsel, 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 can I ask you yes. this, counsel? Can I ask you this? Uh, in, in what respects, in, based on your understanding of the statute, in what respects does the statute alter the common law? Well, it would alter the common law by requiring us to indemnify PGS when the, we have no quote unquote special relationship whereby PGS. No, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what you're saying. I'm asking you based on your understanding of the statute, mm -hmm. how does the statute alter the common law? We don't believe the statute alters the common law. It, it, so it, all of this alters the common law in no respect? Is that your position? Well, it, I, I guess to the extent we're talking about economic damages, damage to a facility caused by an excavation, to the, that extent. The only way it alters the common law is by the limitation on liability that it imposes. The, the but, limit you know, Yes. And it, this is this is a complicated scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just seems a little odd to me that there's so much talk about liability here that if that's just a recapitulation of uh, the common law, it seems like a kind of an odd way to go about it. But I just, for what that's worth. Um, well, if if the statute, I think Justice Mooney's is talking, but we can't hear him. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. There's also the fact that in 2A it creates this rebuttable presumption of negligence language. So in that sense, it's clearly is vis-a-vis -vis the common law. I mean, it's clearly being more specific about what the duties are than if it were just a pure negligence case. And so in that sense, I mean, there's no question that it's an overlay on. It's at least an overlay on the common. I, I totally agree, Your Honor. Um, to, to the extent that it does give rise to a rebuttable presumption of negligence, and to the extent it does uh, talk in terms of each party's liability to the other for economic damages caused to member operators facilities, to that extent, it would alter the common law. But what needs to be remembered here is the fact that this case, that throughout all of the permutations alleged in the, the prior complaints, the prior lawsuits, is not just about a violation of this statute. Um, Mr. Santos, in, in his claims against PGS, listed a number of negligent acts on the part of the facility that have absolutely nothing to do 
with this statute. And, and that's at uh, page 43 of, of the record in this case. But, but counsel, isn't that a matter of defense? I mean, the very narrow issue in this case from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals is whether the statute states a cause of action. It seems to me that there are defenses that uh, could be raised potentially down the road. Comparative negligence has been talked about a lot. Workers' compensation issues have been swirling around this case. That's not an issue here. That there could be other defenses uh, raised procedurally later. But the narrow question here is whether this states a cause of action. Isn't that right? That's correct. But we know, we know from the prior litigation that PGS's claim against Posen is exclusive of uh, their claim for damages to their facilities. That has already been determined in prior litigation. The only damages they're seeking in this case is the monies that they paid to Mr. Santos in satisfaction for his personal injury claim. And remembering that there's nothing in this statutory scheme um, which could conceivably imply that they are entitled to statutory indemnity for those sums. Well, let me, let me put it this way. Let's talk about the, the more, more directly the loss. Um, is it your position that your client is not liable under the statute for personal injury caused by your client's violation of the statute? No, we're not saying that at all. Okay. Um, you know, we were sued for personal injury and we did not get out because the statute doesn't address that. That's not uh, what we're arguing at all. Certainly if, if Posen had caused personal injury, um, to, to Mr. Santos, uh, to Mr. Santos, or to any plaintiff, they're they're um, under the common law. It's very clear that they could be held liable. Well, and under uh, the statute, it's very clear that they could be held liable because that would be part of the total sum of losses attributed to their violation of the statute, right? Well, actually, it's we believe that they're held liable under subsection C, which specifically says that you know, the statute is not the sole remedy and uh, it, does, uh, it does not ex excuse the excavator from liability for any damage or injury resulting from excavation or demolition. We've never argued that somehow we're immune from any and all liability if we uh, violate this statute. But um, you know, what they're arguing in this case is that this court should focus on this statute and specifically 106 without reference to the statutory purpose that is very explicitly set forth in subsection 101, uh, which sets forth in great detail the legislative intent and without considering the legislative history of this statute. And when everything is read in peri materia, it's clear that the legislature was not concerned uh, with personal injury damages. It's concerned uh, with economic damages um, for a violation of this statute by the excavator, by the member operator, <coughs> by a municipality, by the system. That's all that this statute addresses. And their argument that because the statute doesn't define the term losses, it necessary, necessarily is wide open uh, such that it can be interpreted um, to uh, broaden the common law or contrary to the common law by requiring us to indemnify PGS regardless of PGS's fault and regardless of the fact that PGS is not vicariously liable for uh, any alleged negligence on the Posen. Uh, well, the, the statute does say total sum. Why, why would we exclude different types of damages that just may be applicable here? Why, I don't see that in the statute. Well, because the statute 
has to be, because it would be contrary to common law, has to be narrowly construed. And when it is looked at as a whole, against the backdrop of the legislative intent. Let, let, me, let me just stop you right there, because I think this is an important point of law. Um, if, if the statute is plain and, un, and unambiguous, where is the case that says we narrowly construe it? Well, we give it a plain meaning. Um, if it is clear and unambiguous, it can still be narrowly construed if it is contrary to the common law. That is un and, and what's your authority for that is a correct principle of statutory interpretation. The Hardy County case, 221 Southern 3rd, 1162, this court, 2017. Okay. Well, and really, counsel, I mean, it comes back to a matter of context. I mean, plain and unambiguous is really a meaningless concept outside of the idea of what context you're writing in. You know, you can't expect the legislature to write, if they're, if they're assuming a common law background of law in the state of Florida, you can't expect them to write every possible, but we don't mean this, but we don't mean that. There's a certain, within the community to which it's addressed, there's a certain set of background assumptions against which the legislature legislates. So I don't know that it's a matter of strictly construing, it's a matter of giving it a fair reading in the proper context. I, I totally agree with that. I think that you have to consider uh, the common law in conjunction with this. And I think that the legislature absolutely meant for us to do so by emphasizing in subsection 106 to see that an excavator must, regardless of everything else, still operate in a careful, prudent manner based on accepted engineering and construction practices. And regardless of whether it complies with this statute, they're not excused from liability for damage or injury resulting from negligent excavation. So I think that the statute can clearly be harmonized with the common law, but I think that opposing counsel's argument that just because the term losses is undefined in the statute, they can recover anything and everything they can dream up is just simply not supported by the statutory language, by the legislative intent. And as I mentioned at the beginning, no court in this country that has addressed a similar statute, and many, many states have similar statutes, have found an implied right to indemnity without uh, the statute actually saying so, either by using the term indemnity or saying that you can be liable to a member operator for any damages that they've paid to third parties um, as a result of uh, their uh, faulty excavation. Count, uh, counsel, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, how does the phrase, as those costs are normally computed, that appears in subsection 2A and 2B figure into your argument? Uh, yes, Your Honor. We believe that actually it supports our argument that 2A and 2B are solely concerned with the type of economic damage that may be inflicted on a member operator's utility because obviously indemnity claims are not normally, as those damages are normally computed. Um, and interestingly enough, that phrase is only in 2A and 2B. It is not in subsection three, which deals with the member operator's liability uh, to a third person at, for any injury to any person or damage to equipment. Subsection three is the only section that actually uh, excludes that language as normally com uh, computed and includes language uh, addressing injury to a person. Um, so that is a further uh, indication to us that the statute uh, does not provide for a right to indemnity with respect to personal injury damages, which can't possibly be as those damages are normally computed. So in conclusion, 
we believe that absent any language in the statute with reference uh, to statutory indemnity or with reference to the excavator's obligation to indemnify a party for its payment of personal injury damages, it cannot be interpreted uh, to require statutory indemnity or authorize a statutory indemnity cause of action. And we would request uh, that this court find um, that the district court's dismissal of this case was absolutely correct under the law. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal. Your honors, um, they call it indemnity. In every instance, they pose and calls it indemnity or statutory indemnity throughout. I think you can call it indemnity. You can call it damages, which was the alternative in the certified question, I would call it a 556-106 action for losses. I mean, that is what the statute provides for. Um, Posen is, is saying that you can't possibly be construe this to mean, you know, we can recover anything and everything. Well, if it's a loss, this statute says, yes, if it's determined to be a loss that a fact finder finds that they were liable for because they violated the statute, then yeah, everything would be included if it's a loss under the text of the statute. They may not like that, but they need to go to the legislature to get an exception. Counsel, I'm sorry to interrupt you. So are you saying that this lawsuit would basically be a replay of the original lawsuit between Posen and PGS over the accident and who did what and who violated what duty? I mean, it sounds like that's what you're saying. Well, I do think that I don't think it would be a replay. It's not identical, but I do think this statute sets forth a couple of things that PGS will have to demonstrate and show with some evidence. They, we're going to have to get a fact finder to say Posen violated the statute. Posen did these things. I mean, the facts are going to be relevant. This is not an automatic. But, but you is know, your, we're is not your going. Client, is your client's potential negligence going to be relevant in that lawsuit? Or is it just going to be a question of did Posen violate the statute on the one hand and did PGS pay out a settlement on the other? And if the answer is yes to both of those, then that's the end of it. Well, I would answer it this way. If, if the fact finder determines Posen violated the statute and is liable in any way, the legislature has shifted the entire burden of the losses to the excavator it, with this language in the statute, because the legislature has determined that the excavator is in the best position to prevent these losses. So they set out a detailed procedure for them to comply with in, in 556-105. And if they don't comply with those things, all the losses shift to them if we can show they're liable. So there are going to be some fact findings by, by a jury. I, I, they have used several um, canons of statutory construction or interpretive methods that are not appropriate here. Holly B. All, this court said in 1984 that you just don't use, uh, you don't Council, use. Could I, could I ask you about, about how subsection three um, relates to your argument? Because I read that to say that if the member operator fails to discharge a duty, then the member operator is responsible for the loss caused by an injury to another person. Well, the last sentence certainly recognizes that they're not excused. Uh, well, it recognizes, as your honor uh, acknowledged earlier, that there is um, uh, personal injury contemplated by this very subsection. Um, but it, there is not, um, it, if we show that they have violated the statute under 2A or 2B, all of our losses are shifted to them. If they violated the statute and they excavated, and I'm very confident the evidence is- well, Isn't it possible that both parties violated the statute? It, it is possible. Okay, that and, and so subsection three, how, how can you read um, 2B is shifting everything to the excavator when subsection three says that if the member operator um, is violates the statute as well, that the member operator is responsible for the personal injury. David. C is talking about the the member I'm operator. Three. Yeah. yeah. 
Sub subsection. Uh, well, I I'm sorry. I was referring to uh, to subsection two C. Three does not say that if we have violated the statute um, that that we're completely excused. We are going to show that in this action and what we have alleged and what the 11th Circuit is asked about is whether we have a cause of action and we can go present the evidence that they violated the statute and they're responsible. And I am not saying they're foreclosed from bringing any other defenses that they have, but we have a cause of action. The answer to the certified question is yes. Well, but you Thank are you. saying, you, counsel, you are saying, and I know, I know we're, we're over time here, but you are saying that one defense that they would not be able to raise is that your client was negligent. I'm saying that if they did uh, present some comparative negligence, it, does, it the loss has been shifted to them. If we show they violated the statute, and, and that we have, uh, and that they have caused uh, this uh, explosion when they went and excavated. The evidence will be overwhelming. And I'm not saying that they're foreclosed from bringing any defense, but I am saying that they may not like that the legislature has shifted the, uh, all of the burden of the losses to them. Um, but, but that's what was done in the statute. And there were good reasons for that, but they can take it up with the legislature if they want an exception to that. Thank okay. you. Counselor, you're, 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 uh, you're into overtime. You want to sum up? Uh, I ask you to answer the affirmative, uh, answer the certified question in the affirmative. Thank you, your honors. All right. We, uh, Thank you both for your arguments. And now we'll prepare to move on to the next case on our docket uh, first versus DeFrancis.